On behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies, I'm Harley Shaken, the chair of the center. And we're going to be talking about a theme this afternoon that I think is certainly critical to Latin America, but really critical to the role of labor in the global economy today. A topic that, in my view, has gotten all too little attention considering its critical importance. Uh, and I'm particularly pleased to be welcoming Owen Hernstadt uh, to give the talk this afternoon. Uh, Owen is the Chief of Staff to the President of the International Association of Machinists. He's Director of the of, uh, International Affairs for the Machinist Union and has done this for quite a number of years. Uh, and he has thought very seriously about the issues that labor faces in a global economy. He has also engaged these issues in a very hands-on and direct way throughout the world, particularly in Latin America. He's an adjunct professor of law at American University and at George Washington University in DC. Uh, and the Center for Latin American Studies here at Berkeley has cooperated with Owen with the Machinist Union uh, a decade or so ago in a very unusual and, I think, uh, important project. Uh, we brought all the elected leaders of the Machinist Union in North America to Mexico to meet with workers, community leaders, people from independent unions and academics. Uh, that was about 1,100 people yeah. over a three-year period. It was quite an unusual project to talk about issues of globalization and to experience that on the ground. Uh, so Owen will speak, uh, lay out some of the essential parts of his argument, and then we'll have time for a conversation, for questions and comments. Uh, he will be speaking on uh, international uh, labor and human rights in the global, and corporate responsibility, human rights and corporate responsibility in the global economy. Well, Harley, thanks, uh, thanks so much. And as always, it's great to be back here with, uh, with friends and make new friends. On it, Harley and I were just talking and uh, it's such a nice day out. It's gorgeous out. It's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I believe it's Thursday. Um, so I was thinking the best way to proceed would be to go ahead and read uh, this speech that I prepared actually for another group. Um, I can do it in such a way that I look down so you just see the bald head part. Um, and, and, and given my minor teaching uh, responsibilities, I've been able to actually perfect speaking and reading in a complete monotone without, without ever looking up. I can, I mean, Hollywood just wants me because it's just a straight, a straight monotone. Um, obviously, uh, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, obviously, I'm not gonna uh, speak for two or three hours as I was joking with Harley uh, about uh, on it. Um, today, I really wanna begin by addressing the issues that Harley's just mentioned uh, by starting off by describing three situations involving workers in three different countries, uh, Bangladesh, Vietnam, uh, and the United States. Uh, then, you know, in brief time, I'd like to discuss how each of their situations, uh, how they share each of their situations with one another, um, uh, and uh, how they share their situations in a related way given the realities of the global workplace. And then last, uh, I'd like to share with you some ideas and see your ideas uh, on how we work together to alter these global workplace realities. Um, let me begin by uh, just reading, and uh, just a small read uh, of an excerpt in the New York Times that appeared last year. We're almost one year, we're just about at the one year anniversary of the tragic uh, uh, disaster that occurred in, um, at Rana Plaza in Bangladesh. Um, uh, quote, survivors describe the sensation akin to being in an earthquake. 
Hearing a loud and terrifying cracking sound, feeling the concrete factory floor roll beneath their feet and watching concrete beams and pillars collapse, as the eight-story building began to implode, cracks in the poorly and illegally constructed building were found two days before the catastrophe by inspectors, and shops and a bank on the lower floors were immediately closed. But the owners of the garment factories on the upper floors ordered employees to work despite the safety risk. Over 1,100 workers died in the collapse of Reina Plaza, the garment factory in Bangladesh, on April 22nd last year. Most of those who died earned around 22 cents an hour, producing company for worldwide uh, apparel uh, companies and other retailers like Walmart, Gap, and many others. Just six months before the building collapse, over 100 workers had died in a fire at another factory. The doors were locked. There are over 5,000 garment factories in Bangladesh. Many of those are just like those that have been described. Uh, they employ over 3 million workers producing clothing and other apparel items for uh, consumers in Europe and the United States. A few miles outside of Hanoi, Vietnam, sits a facility that produces a critical aerospace part uh, for commercial aircraft. The facility is owned by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, MHI, a Japanese corporation that does many things, including uh, runs a billion dollar a year aerospace industry. Its expansive plant, uh, it has another expansive plant in Nagoya, Japan that produces the same part. Uh, the same part in Vietnam is shipped to Nagoya, Japan, where then it's shipped to the Puget Sound area for assembly. Uh, some of the same production also occurs in the Puget Sound area. When I visited the plant I think it's two and a half years ago. Workers were making around 79 cents an hour. I did a back of the envelope, so it's not really official, but they were making less than a dollar because their wages had gone up, uh, uh, less than a dollar uh, an hour. Let's shift to the US. Uh, in her State of the State address in 2012, South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley the chief executive officer said, and, and by the way, I, I wasn't going to actually read a report to you because it was actually her state of the state address. And I'm about to read this to you, and just so you can see, this is not a paraphrase. This is like state news, South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley's 2012 state of the state address. It's like right here. And she says, quote, I love that we are one of the least unionized states in the country. It is an economic development tool unlike any other. We don't have unions in South Carolina because we don't need unions in South Carolina. We can and will do more to protect South Carolina businesses by shining that light on every action the unions take. We will protect the right of every private and public citizen to refuse to join a union <clears throat> and will make the unions understand full well that they are not needed, not wanted, and not welcome in the state of South Carolina. Uh, in Tennessee, many of you have read just a few weeks ago, uh, a few days before an election concerning uh, unionization efforts uh, and an NLRB election, several state lawmakers warned that they would block future subsidies to the Volkswagen plant, making it less likely to expand if the workers uh, voted for the union. According to the UAW, the anti-union campaign included, quote, widely disseminated threats by elected officials that state financed incentives would be withheld of workers exercising uh, exercise their protected right to form a union. Uh, Senator Bob Corker made a statement on the first day of voting. I've had conversations today and based on those I'm assured that should the workers vote against the UAW, Volkswagen will announce in the coming weeks that it will manufacture its new midsize SUV here in Chattanooga. Um, all right, three different countries, three different workplace situations, three different environments. Uh, obviously, workers in each of these areas shame the, share the same desire to earn a decent living, send their kids to good schools, have health care, retirement security, be treated with dignity in a safe and healthy workplace. They also share the following three realities. One, they're on the spiraling downward slope of a seemingly corporate culture that increasingly undervalues its workers and overvalues its top tier executives. Two, they work in an environment where fundamental human rights, which include international labor standards, 
are viewed not as a key to economic prosperity, but as a barrier to the top 1% wealth, uh, the ability of the top 1% to earn uh, uh, more money. And three, they are all essential for driving a global economy that far too often has left many workers, not all, but many workers, out in the cold. Um, let's just kind of briefly look at the first kind of workplace reality. Uh, perhaps nothing could be more stark uh, than considering at the time of a disaster at Reina Plaza, workers were earning 22 cents an hour. Uh, later, of course, uh, uh, the minimum wage went up in Bangladesh to roughly, I don't know, 60, 64, 68 cents an hour, still well below the poverty level uh, uh, in Bangladesh and still making Bangladeshi apparel workers some of the uh, poorest paid workers uh, in, in the world. Um, workers in Vietnam uh, making less than a dollar an hour uh, to produce aircraft components to some of the, 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 the most innovative technologically advanced equipment uh, in the world uh, speaks for itself. And U.S. productivity in the U.S. increases, but U.S. workers do not share in the gains as compensation for U.S. workers uh, uh, pretty much has been stagnant over the past several years. Um, but, but, but wait a second, but let's look on the bright side. Not, not everyone's pay is undervalued. Uh, Glenn Murphy, for example, head of GAP, uh, received according to the AFL-CIO pay watch, uh, compensation in 2002 of Let's see if I get all the numbers right. $24,627,812. That's good if you get on the AFL-CIO pay watch um, website, which is a great one. James Skinner, head of McDonald's, 2012, uh, $27,741,000. Now, I, I know I'm looking at you. We're making eye contact here. And I know what many of you are thinking. Uh, you're thinking, why are these two guys paid so, well, let's face it, paid so little. Uh, it must be tough when they find out that other CEOs make so much more than they do, like the head of Nike over $35 million, or the head of Disney over $40 million. And all of these guys must be embarrassed when they compare their paychecks with the head of Oracle, who in one year made over $90 million a year. Now, keep in mind, the average worker for, uh, in 2012 in the U.S. earned about $34,000 a year. The CEO to worker pay ratio, which you can also get from the AFL-CIO pay watch site, has this. 1982, it was 42 to 1. 92, it was 201 to 1. In 2012, 354 to 1. And don't even ask me what the ratio would be with a 22 cent an hour Bangladeshi apparel worker. That those math skills are way, way, way beyond me uh, on that. Um, before we address some of these inequities, let's let's look at the second reality, uh, and that one deals with the issue of fundamental human rights and how in far too many places they're treated as a barrier to economic prosperity, let, let alone the social and moral issues on it. I think first, when we talk about fundamental human rights, and this is a Berkeley crowd, probably all well aware of it, but you know, we, we, we talk about some core issues, and then some. Uh, we talk about it in terms of freedom of association, the right to form a union, um, the right not to form a union, the right to engage in collective bargaining, uh, prohibitions against discrimination, forced labor, child labor, uh, protections to make sure that uh, there's a safety, uh, there's a safe and healthy workplace, and I'm not sure I mentioned prohibitions against dis discrimination, but just in case I didn't. Um, they were adopted by the UN, uh, reflected by the International Labor Organization, which is not an international labor organization. It's uh, <laughs> under the umbrella of the United Nations. It's tripartite, made up of employers, governments, and, uh, and uh, uh, representatives of labor uh, on it. And they're reflected by ILO conventions, um, uh, the core conventions, and accompanying jurisprudence, which uh, it helps interpret what these core conventions are. The ILO has three bodies that help do this. And there's a body of 
oh, I dare say, we can't really say case law, but uh, certainly uh, bodies of interpretive documents of what these mean um, uh, uh, for it. Um, the idea the ILO had, the Declaration of Philadelphia, which rejuvenated the ILO after World War II, talked about the necessity of these rights as being linked directly to economic prosperity. The idea is, is that if you know, everybody, everybody prospers, people won't blame each other and won't start shooting at each other. Uh, consumers will have enough money. It's old economic thought. Well proven, by the way, if consumers are happy and they're spending, obviously there's room for more supply, more employment, more tax bases, uh, and all boats are lifted uh, with respect uh, to that. It's also reflected, by the way, in U.S. labor law, the National Labor Relations Act, Section 1. It talks about the need for uh, ending labor strife, uh, for promoting collective bargaining, encouraging collective bargaining, the necessity of that for economic prosperity, as well as the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, which talks about minimum wages, things like that. Talks about the need to end a downward spiral as uh, companies have to compete against each other for the lowest wage and how necessary it is for our own economy uh, of that. Um, uh, on it. Uh, uh, sadly, as we've seen in places like Bangladesh, fundamental human rights are, uh, are, are, are weak. Uh, to be blunt, according to U.S. government uh, reports, and they're replete with those, uh, where uh, 70 workers were confronted by government officials, they were demanding increases in the minimum wage there. In Vietnam, there are other issues in terms of fundamental human rights. Uh, the VGCL, uh, the uh, Confederation of Labor in Vietnam is really the only recognized federation of labor. It's actually in the labor code on that. According to our own State Department country reports, the law does not allow, in Vietnam, the law does not allow workers to organize and join independent unions of their own choice. Uh, the U.S. Labor Department has uh, included garments from Vietnam on its global list of products made with child and, and forced labor. And then, of course, that leaves us with the U.S. Um, and it is amazing that over 75 years after the passage of the National Labor Relations Act, which protects workers' rights to join unions, one of the most courageous things for any worker to do in this country is still to say, I want a union, is still to form a union on that. The law, the current law, falls short of meeting international labor standards. And Harley has done great work on this. And John Logan, who I see back there, has done great work on it. And Lance Kampa, uh, but has many shortfalls. For example, one of my favorite examples, kind of loserish when you say it's my favorite example, but is the whole issue of permanent striker replacement. And a lot of people have probably, well, not a lot, but uh, some people have, have heard the term before. Under the National Labor Relations Act, it's unlawful to fire a worker uh, who's uh, trying to form a union, who's acting with others to seek uh, better wages and working conditions on it. However, if after a union becomes certified by the National Labor Relations Board, uh, the union ends up negotiating a collective bargaining agreement or entering into negotiations with an employer, the law merely says that an employer needs to negotiate in good faith. It doesn't have to end up with a collective bargaining agreement. So if a company forces a union, as long as it's in good faith, they don't agree. Workers are forced to go out on strike. They go out on strike. It's an economic strike. The employer can lawfully hire permanent replacements for, their, for those workers. After the strike, those workers can't get their own jobs back if they've been permanently replaced. So, as I tell my, my law students who ask the question, what's the difference between being fired for union activity and being permanently replaced for going on a lawful economic strike, and I usually like to change topics pretty quick because I'm not sure I have a very good answer other than you know, one of these nuanced academic responses. Because for the worker who's lost their job, there is no difference. And the meaning for those workers is that there is uh, no difference either. By the way, 
after 12 months, someone can file a decertification petition in that union to get uh, unit to get rid of the union. And guess who gets to vote? The permanent striker replacements. And if it's beyond 12 months, since they've been out on strike and they've been permanently replaced. The original workers have voted for the union. They're not in the voting lineup uh, uh, for that. There are other problems with international labor standards in the US, prohibitions on secondary activity, long, a little bit longer complicated uh, on that, um, uh, inadequate remedies, including back pay. Um, the Supreme Court had a case called Hopman Plastics a few years ago, where they said even though a company violated the law, the victims of that violation uh, didn't get a remedy of back pay because they were undocumented workers uh, on that. And of course, uh, companies can still undertake captive audience speeches during work time to tell workers their thoughts about unionization and other things like that. And you add to that all those lawful activities, all these other things that I guess are lawful, I don't know, um, uh, and that is all the extraneous third-party money that's going into campaigns like that uh, John Logan and Harley have talked about, you know, the Volkswagen campaign with a lot of high-financed, mysterious folks uh, coming in uh, on that, and you can see where issues of fundamental human rights in the U.S. also uh, raise another uh, difficult reality in the workplace uh, for workers here. Um, let me turn to the, the third, the third uh, uh, reality uh, that these workers in these different countries share, and, and that is a global economy that, while not always, far too often leaves them out in the cold. Um, uh, we start off really with the North American Free Trade Agreement, and Harley talked about the wonderful partnership uh, um, uh, the center has uh, had with the International Association of Machinists, uh, where students uh, led uh, our leadership uh, through the Maquia Doras, as well as the leadership of uh, giant global union federation, international folks at the International Metal Workers Federation who came from around the world, uh, who went through the Maquia Doras just to understand what NAFTA meant. It was very important, particularly for European leaders who hadn't seen the raw display of what a trade agreement uh, could actually mean uh, for workers, not only in Mexico, but uh, for workers in the United States and workers in Canada. Um, you know, we warned about the dangers of NAFTA. It's been 20 years. Unfortunately, all of our nightmarish scenarios have come true. Communities have been ravaged by it. We uh, had one Maytag family say when they lost their jobs in Galesburg, Illinois, when that work went to Mexico, I remember uh, they said, um, uh, tell other workers NAFTA is coming to them. Wow. You know? And it, it is unfortunately proven to be true. All those low skilled jobs that we were talked about that would be, have been painful enough to have lost to Mexico. Well, we've lost the high-skilled jobs as well, just like we warned about. Mexico's aerospace industry is burgeoning. Over 30,000 workers now work in that industry, performing work for US companies as well as European companies, uh, performing some of the state-of-the-art, technologically advanced work uh, in, uh, in the area. And um, as Harley and others have talked about, workers in Mexico, Canada, and the US have not profited uh, from NAFTA. Uh, on it. We warned about a trade template uh, that left workers out, that had inadequate labor standards or in, uh, inadequate labor standards uh, that were not transparent. Um, nobody knew what was going on, negotiated behind sort of backroom deals. Uh, uh, we warned about investor to state dispute, dispute resolution mechanisms. Uh, that put environmental issues and social regulations, workplace regulations perhaps at risk uh, on that, as well as many other problems uh, dealing with trade templates uh, that didn't uh, establish a fair uh, playing field. That, in fact, one could argue really didn't have as much to do about trade as they did uh, about easing outward flowing investment countries. Uh, where fundamental human rights weren't respected uh, on that. 
Uh, we're, we're facing, facing now, by the way, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, TPP. The IM has uh, been uh, pretty outspoken, uh, along with other unions, uh, about uh, our deep concerns and objections to this trade agreement. It hasn't been fully negotiated yet, uh, but if it's anything like we fear it could be, uh, it certainly wouldn't represent the 21st century trade agreement that I think all of us are hoping for, one that puts, uh, not to sound too sloganistic, but puts people uh, ahead uh, on this. Uh, we are looking closely at the transatlantic trade um, uh, agreement uh, as well uh, that would merge effectively the markets of the U.S. and the European Union uh, as well. I, I could go on, but um, let me kind of turn uh, uh, a little bit to um, what, uh, what folks are doing and some of the activities that are taking place to actually turn uh, this global workplace reality around, or at least to prop up the good parts of the reality that are uh, uh, just and, and, uh, and equitable. Um, uh, there are many things, and I think probably many of you in this room have probably thought up many of them and are working on many of them, I'll bet. Um, some of them has to do with the issue of undervaluing workers. Uh, we talk about raising wages. Well, you know, I mean, one of the best ways to raise wages is to permit workers to form their own union uh, on that. Uh, so you've heard of innovative organizing campaigns. You could talk about the organizing efforts that have gone on with low-wage workers uh, in the fast food industries uh, and elsewhere. Innovative campaigns, my own union, the Machinist Union, organized IKEA, uh, IKEA's first production unit in Danville, Virginia, uh, and did so um, uh, in a variety of innovative ways. Uh, by getting the Swedish media involved, for example, uh, and having Swedish reporters come to Danville, Virginia, and write stories that went back home. I've got a, uh, I've got a video uh, of, uh, I'm told it's the equivalent of 60 minutes in Sweden, uh, and all I can do is I can tell that the production looks pretty good. I can't understand a word of it, but uh, they did an expose. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I can use the word expose, but a story on what was going on uh, at IKEA, which was not, by the way, which was not a bad, bad employer. But, you know, it was the type of thing where Swedish, um, uh, Swedish folks were asking IKEA in the country, what are you doing in the U.S.? You treat workers so well here. Uh, we expect that you treat workers the same uh, throughout the world. The machinists, we won that. We won that unit. We've been organizing workers in IKEA warehouses. Uh, we've been um, developing networks. This isn't just the machinist unions, other labor unions, but the machinists have been working hard and a very long time on these efforts. We've got networks of workers throughout the world at a variety of different corporations uh, with all sorts of electronics and things that my 15-year-old son usually has to explain to me. Uh, folks can communicate with one another. I know you guys are all looking at me like, yeah, you know, L word. But um, uh, very quickly with one another. And let me give you one example uh, where, uh, I'll give you two examples uh, where uh, it hasn't been a heavy lift, where that's worked uh, amazingly well. Uh, our British trade union friends were in negotiations with an airline at London Heathrow, one that we, the Machinist Union, have organized for many years. And the company was giving them a line in terms of negotiations, economic issues. And they immediately just emailed us and said, hey, is this true? We emailed back, said, hey, look, you know what? Call their bluff. We, we don't know why that would be true. And they did. Ended up being pretty good negotiations for them. It wasn't a heavy lift. Just a matter of communications and trusting the people that you know and being able to do that. Uh, we had other examples where we were able to go to a uh, supervisory board and call a company's bluff uh, when they were talking about moving to Mexico, um, uh, calling their supervisory board in, in, in Europe or our contacts uh, there uh, of it. And there are other ways, too. You know, we also don't promote a lot of things that we do uh, because, you know, obviously 
um, we don't want to cause a lot of attention as well. The main thing is to get the job done and, and, and represent workers the best we can. The Machinist Union, we've entered into a lot of close alliances with strategically placed unions throughout the world. Iggy Mattel, the giant German metal workers union, we have an alliance agreement with them. IF Mattel in Sweden. In Australia, the Australian Workers' Union, we have uh, an alliance with a Japanese union, um, as well as quite a few others. We work with Industrial Europe uh, and, uh, and still many other unions. And we're working together to, uh, with, uh, with a variety of European unions uh, to try to come up with a common position on the TTIP on the transatlantic uh, trade agreement uh, so that negotiators know on both sides of the pond uh, that workers are talking to one another and we're coordinating and our positions mean something uh, and we're sincere and we are, uh, we are in agreement and we're harmonized uh, about that. Uh, we continue obviously in terms of trade agreements to talk about more transparency. Uh, so folks can understand what's going on. We continue to demand that before we enter into future trade agreements, we take stock of what economic impact or impact on our communities have past trade agreements had. It is mind-boggling that that hasn't really occurred. It's mind-boggling that we go off and negotiate new trade agreements without determining how it impacts on folks uh, in California and folks in Iowa and Minnesota, how different industries, real people, how they're impacted uh, on trade uh, on that as well. We continue to insist that these trade agreements, when they talk about international labor standards, that they encompass those ILO conventions that I mentioned and that jurisprudence. It gives predictability to everyone that's involved. They're not perfect, but it's the best thing we have where different countries have agreed upon what, for example, freedom of association means and collective bargaining means. And without that, you're left with ambiguity, like the current, what we call the current Peru labor standard, which merely references the Declaration of Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work. It's a principles document. We're talking about a rights document on it, something that's clear. We're developing things like uh, components to carriers um, uh, program with uh, two uh, global union federations. These are federations of, uh, of uh, unions in different industries. One is in transport, the other is in uh, manufacturing. Uh, and we're trying to figure out how do you organize everyone from the supplier chain up through the assembly chain of a product and how do you get everyone uh, together on that. Uh, many folks are working on issues dealing with corporate governance and of course uh, CEO pay uh, on that, shareholder actions as well as uh, minimum wage campaigns, probably much more important, livable wage campaigns. I know Berkeley has been at the forefront of things like that. Um, trying to eliminate misclassification of workers, uh, uh, labeling workers as independent contractors or other contingent workers where they escape uh, the regulations of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Heck, they can even escape uh, workers' compensation laws and other laws uh, as well uh, on that. Um, and we're working uh, with other um, uh, international unions as well as other global union federations to bring corporate responsibility to the workplace in a real way um, through the effort of international framework agreements. There are over 80 now international framework agreements that exist between multinational corporations and global union federations and works councils and unions uh, which have uh, language which addresses the issue of fundamental human rights and which some actually do cover suppliers not as strongly as I would like to see. Some not as strong as I'd like to see have enforcement mechanisms. But when you are where we are in terms of trying to uh, get companies to see the importance of corporate social responsibility, framework agreements do represent at least one area of promise uh, where, we can, uh, where we can obtain that. Um, I had this long conclusion uh, you know, on it where I was going to talk about, oh, uh, you know, I was going to give you sort of a haiku poem and, and all of this other stuff on it. 
Uh, but I, I do fear I'm now kind of entering into the area where I promised I wouldn't go, and that is speaking for hours and hours uh, on this. So let me just conclude uh, this, this part of the talk uh, by saying, you know, we do have a tough workplace reality, uh, but we do have real rays of hope. Uh, in Bangladesh, for example, um, uh, an accord was reached. And I'm very proud that the machinists were part of that effort through our Global Union Federation Industrial, who worked with the Workers' Rights Consortium and the International Labor Rights Forum and others to bring, I think now it's over 90, I lost count, uh, apparel companies and retailers to the table to help address the building fire, building collapse and fire issues uh, in Bangladesh in a very real way. And some would say it's really the first real framework agreement that has real teeth uh, in it. And I think we're very proud of that. It's at its nascent stage, but there's some great folks that are working on that and pushing that forward. And as sort of the last little kind of ray of hope is, you know, also is, you know, the folks that attack all of these things, they tend to attack organized labor as an institution. Their problem is, of course, and please don't tell them this, don't tell, I don't want them to know it, is that, you know, part of organized labor, most of organized labor, it's a movement. In most cases, it's a progressive movement that has many different alliances, right, with environmental groups, consumer groups, community groups, uh, civil rights groups all over. Uh, and, you know, kind of going after one institution, it's going to take a lot more than that. I think really to kill off a movement, particularly if it's a movement that's based on sort of justice and equity in the workplace, not only here in the US, but in Bangladesh and Vietnam, and I didn't even start to talk about China, but throughout the world. Good. Okay. Well, thank you, Owen. And now we have time for questions and comments. Yes. Uh, it was really heartening hearing some of the real things people were trying to, people like we were trying to do to make Facebook work or as a, a reality in this world. So I was, I appreciate it. Oh, great. Thanks. And um, I, I got to confess, though, I think maybe from teaching Mark today, I have a bit of a, of a, a pessimistic taste in my mouth. I mean, like, a, from that statement that you started with, the, the anti-union sentiment is so blatant. You know, like we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna favor businesses by basically chopping up the heads of unions, yeah. and not only that, but in the past 30, 40 years, organized business has gained such tremendous political power. Um, so I, I really I really see the need, and I'm willing to be even be a part of the movement toward basic worker rights. But the counter thrust is just enormous. So the question I have is, uh, how big does this organization effort need to be? Well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the, that's the huge question. Um, and I'm not sure there's an answer to that. Uh, um, there's much smarter people, I think there are smarter people in this room than me that can help with that. Um, I think the thing, but big, <laughs> I think the thing that is so sobering that we've seen in the last five years and that, you know, I guess, I'm feeling kind of old these days. I've been a lawyer now for like 29 years, almost 29 years. And I have never in my imagination, and I was talking to John Logan about this just yesterday, I've never imagined the extremism, uh, the beyond sort of common discourse line uh, that uh, some folks in their hostility have moved. Um, the money, the billions of dollars in keeping workers from forming a union, uh, the tax, whether they're personal or whatnot, the tax against the National Labor Relations Board for, you know, basic labor law decisions. I mean, you know, this is the NLRB. This is like, you know, a small federal agency which has a very good reputation in terms of efficiency and elsewhere, but you know, a tax on the institution uh, itself, on, on, on ideological money that has nothing to do with, you know, labor unions per se. And, you know, I think hopefully folks will wake up and see that. 
uh, and uh, and that will have its own own common sense response. Uh, but the extremism is is really quite alarming, I think. So you know, when we talk about a response, I'm sure there are political scientists out there that you know probably have the correct answer. I, I, all I can say is, uh, you know, really effective. <laughs> so. Yes. Um, well, I also really enjoyed the talk, and it's actually kind of a related question. I mean, today you covered kind of precarious labor, and you sure. talked a little bit about the machinist union and export sectors, but I wonder, you know, there are other sectors of labor that, um, that are kind of complicated, so I'm, so sort of certain public sector unions, sure. for example, sometimes are, are stigmatized as labor aristocracy. Um, I do some research on teachers' unions, um, and they've certainly been kind of attacked in the media. Um, recently, in the Bay Area, there was a transit art worker strike that I think really kind of, um, you know, got a mixed reaction. I think a lot of people sort of were kind of, um, I think, surprisingly negative towards the transit workers because they felt they were sort of a, a high wage, low skill kind of sector. Um, and I, and I, I wonder, um, you know, how, how should you respond to these kinds of anti union kinds of. Um, campaigns and these sort of efforts to kind of stigmatize labor and sort of, I think, draw on this kind of individualistic ethos that is very strong in the United States. That's a great, What's the best response? That's a great, that's a great question. You know, first of all, um, and there's a great point you made out, and, and, and one of the points is organized labor is not this monolith. You know, it's a movement, there are different unions, there are different situations, etc. on that. So th that's kind of one. Right. Uh, but two, in terms of the public sector labor unions, now I'm not going to comment on the BART stuff because folks here are much more experts on that than I ever could be. Uh, but in terms of the public sector, and by the way, the machinist union, I should have prefaced, we represent a lot of manufacturing folks, electronics, John Deere, Caterpillar, Boeing, um, Lockheed, all that stuff. We represent a lot in the defense industry, but we also represent woodworkers. We represent municipal workers. We represent uh, folks that work, I believe, at the Forest Service. Um, and they work for the federal government uh, as well uh, on that. So we're pretty diverse and we're pretty widespread. In terms of the public sector workers, you know, part of it that folks, I'm not sure folks quite get, is that public sector workers sacrificed wage increases, sacrificed a lot of stuff for those pensions. Those pensions weren't gifts. Those pensions were earned. And when you make a promise to give a pension, you expect that promise to be there at the end of the day. When it exists, when that promise gets broken with the private sector, it's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Uh, you know, when the private sector goes bankrupt or a company goes bankrupt, it's, it's, it's devastating, in fact. Uh, all those foregone wages and increases you gave up. But when it's the public sector and the faith of the state turning its back on you, that's really a problematic. And when unions are vilified for budget issues, for a variety of other issues as well, that also is extraordinarily difficult uh, to make uh, on it. Um, and, you know, in terms of the teachers and other things, you know, the AFT is a great union and they do the best they can do to represent their members and they'll continue uh, to do that. Um, so many times there's an effort to vilify, you know, one side or, or the, the side of unions, and it's nothing new. You know, it's something that occurred well before there was a National Labor Relations Act when President Hayes called on the Secretary of War when railroad workers went on strike at the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Uh, unions and workers were being vilified for demanding better wages. Um, the sit-down strikes uh, that had occurred, as well as the Eastern Airlines strike and, and many other strikes. It's always convenient to kind of vilify workers for, you know, demanding just and equitable, equitable wages. Yes. Hi. Um, so I really enjoyed the talk, and I just spent a lot of this all um, And I... Um, and there are lots of rich examples of uh, ways in which workers in different parts of the world are, are converting their economic linkages into um, sources of 
of concrete power and pressure points, um, like the workers in the U.S. and Sweden work for IKEA, um, in these global frameworks for supply chain linkages or, or uh, advocacy around free trade agreements. Um, and I was wondering if there's another dimension to this, uh, to this organizing that's more about capacity building and leadership building. Uh, and if you could speak uh, to that, is, uh, how do you see that happening uh, between workers and different types of people? Yeah. Um, you know, it really goes to the heart of everything, doesn't it? Uh, and uh, it's probably broader than, broader than even that. Um, and in terms of international work, it really starts with building a fundamental understanding um, with one another about how each other's system works, for example. You know, our, my European friends, brothers and sisters, they, they like to talk about social dialogue. And, and, and you bring them over here and you take them on an organizing campaign, and e even, even the folks, the, the trade unionists from the UK, even them and going through Margaret Thatcher and all that stuff, when they go on a campaign with us, they had no idea what to expect, right? So it starts with kind of making sure everybody understands uh, uh, each other's each other's systems uh, on that, and and I think we are making great headway uh, on that in a in a variety of areas and kind of building the next big leaders, the next sort of big movement leaders. You know, well, we have our own educational system at the Machinist Union. We we put uh, we have a huge training center called the William Wimpesinger something center. I wish this hadn't been taped and I didn't get the last W right. But, um, uh, but anyway, you know, where we got full faculty, full time faculty folks, and we run through uh, literally thousands of our members uh, uh, on variety of training courses, leadership development, things like that. Uh, and we're working in terms of educational systems with other unions abroad. Uh, on that, and we're also working to develop international trade union leaders, but and we're also working to develop alliances with other groups. That the accord, the uh, the uh, accord in terms of Bangladesh parallel. I mean, that didn't come just from industrial, the Global Union Federation, and the Workers' Rights uh, Coalition. It came from working with the Clean Clothes Campaign, you know, based in Europe and others as well. So it's broadening out those networks. I'm not quite sure that got to your question, but. Uh, hopefully it made some edgeway in it. Uh, I'd like to make two very brief comments that, that build on, on what your question was. Uh, the first concerns something we mentioned right at the beginning. I mentioned in the introduction about uh, going with roughly 1,100 elected leaders of the Machinist Union from across North America in small groups uh, to Mexico, and as you pointed out, led by graduate students and on occasion undergraduates here at UC Berkeley. What was the purpose of this trip? Well, it began out of the NAFTA debate. The machinists played a very strong role in that debate in Washington, as many other unions did, but the machinists were unique in an important way. They wanted their local leaders to really understand what was going on. They wanted their local leaders to look at workers and worker organizations in Mexico as allies, not adversaries. In any trade debate, it could go either way. Uh, and it was really an extraordinarily powerful experience on each of the trips, in all the buses that, that went. Where going down, you had some workers at least who were elected leaders feeling angry, feeling that the Mexican workers were part of the problem. You go to Mexico or any country, you go into people's homes, you go into community centers, you speak to community leaders, you speak to people from independent unions, you don't have that attitude. It's very hard. You're looking at human beings in the same struggle, often working in the same industries that you are. And it transformed the nature of the debate. It gave an unusual depth and understanding. It wasn't simply a visit. It was usually a day and a half, sometimes two days, conversation before, uh, discussions before, 
discussions afterwards about the core issues, alternatives, and what the union could do. That really resonated. That's an unusual, I think, what international solidarity can be about. The second dimension is it goes back even before that. Uh, some of you, I think, are aware that uh, we did an advanced screening of a new film, Cesar Chavez, that's now in the theaters. I think it's a very compelling film about Cesar Chavez, about the birth of the farm workers uh, movement. And there's a scene towards the end of the film. It goes into the early 70s. And that's a scene where the, the farm workers are doing a, a boycott. The boycott is very successful. Uh, and as an end run around the boycott, uh, grapes are shipped to Europe. Uh, through the Reagan administration here uh, in, in California, when Ronald Reagan was governor, uh, but through the growers in international context, and it was having a measurable effect. And all of a sudden, the farm workers and the AFL-CAO were able to make linkages with British trade unions. Cesar Chavez and farm worker leaders went to London. And there's this very powerful scene in the film of people taking the grapes and dumping them into the Thames symbolically, you know, to indicate that this was a single struggle. So these aren't simply nice ideas. They can have a certain resonance in a context that is enormously difficult. Let me, let me give you one, one really just short uh, example of uh, Brazilian workers. So we, we brought a bunch of folks to, uh, uh, I think it was, a, it was a while ago, a jet engine, I think, factory in Brazil. Uh, we shared the same company, produced the same thing, and uh, our members were trying, and we, we, we worked very closely with the, the Brazilian aerospace workers, and, uh, and we built a nice relationship with them, but you know, we were talking about how uh, our negotiators uh, were talking about how when we negotiate with this company in the U.S., uh, the most recent negotiations, they had said, uh, if you don't take these reduction in wages or these wage concessions, we're going to take this work and we're going we're to give it to the folks in Brazil, to our plant in Brazil. And uh, our, our, uh, our Brazilian brother started to laugh and, you know, we we're kind of like scratching our heads. And he said, no, 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 he said, you don't understand. He said, we just got done with negotiations. And they said something about you have to take these concessions because if we don't, we're going to ship this work to the United States. Uh, so you can see right away, you know, when these linkages and 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 these faces come together, what a difference it makes. We had a we had a thing that we did a few years ago uh, with shop stewards at a, at an uh, um, uh, manufacturing plant in Hamburg, Germany, uh, with uh, the manufacturing plant in, um, in Horicon, Wisconsin, I think it was John Deere, uh, on it. And you know, we did it a few times, and it was great, because they saw each other. They were doing almost, I think they were doing similar work. But you can see how that quickly gets established, particularly through Skype and other things like that. Could, could I ask you a question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this element here, as an excellent question, you were at part of it, you were part of it. Sure. These three students are looking for what they can do in a large movement to solve the problems that we all are facing. And I believe that what's been lost in the conversation <coughs> is that our government itself, the U.S. government, is totally controlled by corporations today. And in the old days, the Democratic Party was the trade, the, the Labor Party, no more. Not since Bill Clinton pushed NAFTA and then destroyed the Glass-Steagall Act. It protected us against bank fraud. And then on to what Obama's done in holding the TPP negotiations in secret. So nobody knows what's happening except the 600 lobbyists there that are pushing for certain things. What we need is a labor party. We need a new political party that represents the workers, the people, the environmentalists, and everybody else that needs help, certainly students. They're, they're the, the most injured area in terms of population, high unemployment, the, the uh, tuition is so high that so many of them do not anymore have access to higher education, all of that. 
and we need a new party that represents us. That is what you need to actually create yourselves. Okay, I wrote a book about it, several books. But you guys have to get involved in it. You're not going to get it. The unions, their, their population is going down. They're good people, but they're now a very, very small percentage of the working people. We need the unions with us, but we've got to lead the way. And many revolutions were started, and I don't want a revolution. I want to vote. I want people to vote. And uh, get I, us and I have to ask the you to. Parties. Okay. Uh, do you have any comments? No, no, I, you know, welcome all comments, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, this will, unfortunately, this will be our last okay, question. I had a much more modest level. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was interested in your uh, comment about what you did with IKEA, yeah. which is you brought a bunch of uh, journalists over. I've been struck over the years that the journalistic presence of you know, covering labor issues is almost not existent in this country. Yeah. And and I wonder, you know, why the union movement doesn't devote more attention to that and why you don't constantly take American journalists, you know, um, you know, bring them into your just even to, you know have forums to educate them, to show them, to demonstrate um, to them and it, I mean I don't know what else is possible. I'm I'm uh, I've been struck with that. Um, the news hour in NPR, somebody funds a, a, a segment that they do periodically on health issues. I mean, why couldn't they occasionally or, you know, would yeah. fund something on labor issues? It's obviously something that affects job issues, employment issues writ large, something that affects a huge number of people. And, and, um, and, and you know, the, the unionized sector is obviously has shrunk tremendously, but um, you know there has to be an argument for what unions do and why people should think about them in a different way because all of that argument has been lost sight of in this country, and all of the um, sort of initiative for how we should think about that has gone to the Republicans. Uh, you know, um, I I uh, I hear you, and I I couldn't agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more. And um, uh, I I think my my lovely spouse gets so tired of me uh, ranting and raving every time I open the newspaper about a story that hasn't been reported on on it. So so I I, I hear that. Um, there are efforts that are are being made. I think a, a lot of it. And, and look, I mean, I'm not saying from any experience or anything like that, but you know, a lot of it is this stuff isn't even taught in schools, um, uh, in grade schools, in high schools. This is a critical part of our history, but more than our history, it's you know how we how we are to prosper on it. And there are generations of people that uh, don't don't know about labor unions. They don't know about progressive causes on that. Um, and, and maybe it starts with that uh, on it. Um, you know, uh, journalists, uh, you know, there have been a lot of layoffs in terms of journalists. Uh, there aren't that many labor, I don't even know, there's, I can only think of one labor reporter left. Maybe there's probably two or three uh, on that as well. Um, so it is a sorry state of affairs, and I wish I had a, I wish I had a great answer for you other than, you know, it's one area where obviously drives me nuts. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to continue this discussion. Thank you, Owen, for being thank here. Thank you.